Greetings. Father Mark signing on with a presentation on Martin Luther King Jr. Day given for the seminary and also uploaded to my YouTube channel for, uh, for the use of, my, of the parish and the school at which I serve, St. Louis King of France. It is, uh, this presentation is uh, part of a day of reflection given at the seminary, specifically on MLK Day, on issues of racism. Uh, this is, I'm doing this in the video format for two reasons. First, because of the COVID quarantine at the seminary. And second, because I have a funeral uh, at, at my parish on the day which is for a priest who formerly served at this parish. So I ask your prayers for the repose of the soul of Father Ronald Bro, whose funeral uh, we will be having, presided over by Archbishop Amon, uh, while you in the seminary are uh, doing your day of reflection. So by way of introduction, on the second day of November, 1983, the 40th President of the United States Ronald Reagan signed a bill creating a federal holiday honoring the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Historical perspective on this day must begin with the reason it exists. The answer takes us back 15 years earlier to 6.01 p.m. on the fourth day of April, 1968. Memphis, Tennessee. A 41-year-old Korea criminal named James Earl Ray fired a 30 caliber bullet from a Remington Model 760 rifle at the Reverend King, who was standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel in front of room 306. The bullet struck King in the face entering his right cheek, breaking his jaw, several vertebrae in the neck as it traveled down his spinal cord, severing the jugular vein before, <clears throat> before lodging in his shoulder. King was brought to St. Joseph Hospital. He never regained consciousness. He died at 7.05 p.m. at the age of 39. Many, many, Books, documentaries, and movies are devoted to preserving and analyzing the significance of this event and its context. Our purpose today is coming to terms with a religious and a historical perspective on the background of this crime. We can find no better beginning than in the first papal encyclical addressed specifically to the United States promulgated 73 years earlier on the 6th day of January, 1895, by the 256th Pope, Leo XIII. Titled Longinqua Oceani, meaning across the wide expanse, meaning the ocean, across the ocean, Pope Leo wrote the following words in section 22 of the encyclical. Finally, we cannot pass over in silence those whose long-continued unhappy lot implores and demands relief from men of apostolic zeal. We refer to the Indians and the Negroes, and I'm sorry, that, those are the words he used, who are to be found within the confines of America. How wide a field for cultivation, how great a multitude of human beings to be partakers of the blessing derived through Jesus Christ. Now he used words common in his time to describe Native Americans and African Americans. Yet his warning concerning the neglect of those groups can be traced back 107 years earlier to the 21st day of June in the year 1788 when the Constitution of the United States went into effect as the government of the former 13 colonies of Great Britain. In Article 1, Section 2 of that document, we find the following words. Representatives 
and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. This detached language of accounting requires some translation in order to appreciate its significance. It established five categories of persons under the Constitution. Free persons, those bound to service for a term of years, which included prisoners. Third, the same, those bound to service for a term of years in the form of indentured servitude. Indians, meaning the indigenous people, the First Nations, as we call them today, and three-fifths of all other persons. Who are they? Those are the slaves. Such differentiation raises a philosophical question. How can this be? A human being is a person, period. Not a rock, not a tree, not a horse. Moreover, theologically, based on Genesis chapter 1, we believe that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. The internal contradiction of this division of persons into five categories was perceived at the time that the document was written, including by the author of the Constitution and future President of the United States, James Madison. He explained it as follows on the 12th of February, 1788, in one of the Federalist Papers, if you want to look it up, this is Federalist number 54, it, which reads in part, quote, We must deny the fact that slaves are considered merely as property and in no respect whatsoever as persons. The true state of the case is this, that they partake of both these qualities, being considered by our laws, in some respects, as persons, and in other respects, as property. In being compelled to labor, not for himself, but for a master, in being venable by one master to another master, and in being subject at all times to be restrained in his liberty and chastised in his body by the capricious will of another, the slave may appear to be degraded from the human rank and classed with those irrational animals which fall under the legal denomination of property. In being protected, on the other hand, in his life and in his limbs against the violence of all others, even the master of his labor and his liberty, and in being punishable himself for all violence committed against others, the slave is no less, evidently, regarded by the law as a member of society, not as part of the irrational creation, but as a moral person, not as a mere article of property. The federal constitution, therefore, decides with great propriety on the cases of our slaves when it views them in their mixed character of person and property. This is, in fact, their true character. End quote. Understanding the dual offense against philosophy and theology represented in this passage by someone who certainly had enough philosophical training to know better requires us to travel back 12 years earlier to the fourth day of July, 1776, and the 1,337 words 
of the Declaration of Independence. In the second paragraph, we find the famous sentence we all know, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Period. Yet the very next sentence, so happiness, period, the very next sentence, quote, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Close reading, end quote. Now, a close reading of these two sentences show that the second sentence reverses the declaration of the first. And herein we find the answer to how the philosophical and theological offense of the three-fifths rule, three-fifths of a person, was accomplished. The foundational document of the nation contains the real, the unvarnished truth, expressed in different ways, in a different form by James Madison in the quote we just read from Federalist 54. To put it another way, laws are not based on an unalienable rights, nor are they based on the will of God, but rather on governments, deriving their power from the consent of the governed, meaning those who at a given moment in time have control of the coercive apparatus of that government. If they decide that slavery is right, and counting them as three-fifths of persons is proper, then it will be. It will be until another moment in time when others in control decide otherwise. The inescapable corollary is that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are not unalienable rights. They never were. They can be, and they have been, taken arbitrarily throughout our history by those with power from those without power. Yet, this did not just happen. Because nothing just happens. There's always cause and effect. There are always reasons. Now, those reasons might be stupid, but there are reasons. The spiritual reasons these rights were taken from slaves can be traced to the sins of pride, greed, and ethnic hatred. The practical reason these rights were taken in the, in the context of the time of the documents I just quoted, both 1776 and 1788, was the need to establish unity among the former 13 colonies. The largest of the colonies was Virginia, the economy of which was built on the foundation of slave-worked plantations. Some of the most influential of the Founding Fathers were slave-owning Virginians, like Washington, the first president, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and James Madison, whom we just quoted, who wrote the Constitution. Without legal recognition of slavery, it would not have been possible to form the Union in that time and place. One of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, John Rutledge, of South Carolina was the most honest among them when he told the other delegates at the convention, quote, religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question. Interest alone is the governing principle of nations, end quote. The specific interest to which he referred was property rights thereby perpetuating the deliberate confusion of person and property proposed previously by James Madison. This was enshrined elsewhere in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, which reads, quote, No person held to service or labor in one state 
under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom service or labor may be due. End quote. Meaning that escaped slaves, say the way they, they do these circumlocutions in the document, meaning escaped slaves were to be treated as property and returned to their owner. Turning back to the connection between theology and history, the church teaches that slavery is a sin against the dignity of persons. That's a quote from the Catechism, number 2414. Now we know this is based on the book of Genesis, chapter 1, which reveals that the uniqueness and the dignity of humanity was part of God's original design. Dominion was given to humans over animals, not over each other. God did not create any human being to be a slave. That's in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Let us make man in our own image, male and female, we created them. Yes, sir. The process of drifting away from God's will began two chapters later. Genesis, chapter 3. The original sin was disobedience of God's will, which flowed from the sin of pride, specifically the decision to follow our own will instead of God's command. Given this choice, it is with a complete lack of surprise that we read in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 4, the first homicide. This first act of murder Cain murdering his brother Abel, and all the other murders which followed, are only possible because of the sinful belief that one human has the right to take the life of another. Without this ultimate form of pride, the sin of slavery would not have been possible. We decide we can take their life by killing them, or we can take their life by lifelong servitude. Slavery makes its way into the biblical narrative through the experiences of the descendants of Abraham's second son, Isaac. Genesis chapter 37. Joseph's own brothers chose to sell him like an animal to a caravan headed for pagan Egypt. This marks the appearance of slavery as commerce in the Bible. It is the result of the sins of wounded pride among the brothers, jealousy and envy, because the father preferred Joseph over them, just as the first murder was the result of wounded pride, Cain's wounded pride, that God preferred Abel's sacrifice over his. Well, therefore, I can kill the guy. Yeah, that, that's, or sell him into, into slavery, a living death, a living death of slavery. See, it all goes back to that sin. That it, nothing just happens. It's the sin. It's the, in, the, internal, the internal erroneous decision to contradict God's will revealed in Genesis 1, that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. That the decision to contradict that then manifests as an act, the act of sin, either murder or enslavement. Genesis chapters 46, 47 records that the Hebrews relocated to Egypt during a time of famine. Exodus chapter 1 records that after Joseph's death, the Egyptians rose up and overthrew the government that had welcomed the Hebrew refugees during the prior famine and treated them as ethnically alien prisoners of war. As a result, the Egyptians enslaved the Hebrew population in Egypt for 430 years. In this, we find two additions to the institution of slavery. Ethnic hatred, or to use the conventional term today, racism, and slavery justified by right of conquest. It should be noted that such ethnic hatred and right of conquest slavery is not limited to differences in skin color. One example 
The lamentable history of the English occupation of Ireland demonstrates this, with both the oppressors and the oppressed having white skin. But still, there was the ethnic hatred. There was the opposition. There was the military invasion, the, the theft of the country and, and rights based on right of conquest. So that all, it's the sin that is the deepest underlying dynamic. Skin color is an excuse. Ethnic differences are an excuse often used, but the reason, the true reason, is the sin, is the pride, the decision to contradict God's will, the revelation of God's will, that we are all made in the image and likeness of God. The correct theological view is summarized in many parts of the Bible. One example, well known, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28, quote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free person, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Slavery made its way to the continents of North and South America in the modern period, first through the agency of the Portuguese commercial exploration to develop trade routes to East Asia by sailing around the continent of Africa. To facilitate their exploration, the Portuguese conquered the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. If you find uh, southern Morocco on today's maps and go west, the Canary Islands are, are there off the coast of southern Morocco. Uh, they did this to use as a base of operations to resupply their... Sh what is that? Oh, <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, to, uh, so here we have again, the, uh, uh, they felt justified by right of conquest to enslave the indigenous population of the Canary Islands as spoils of war. You see, property again, viewing them as property, not persons. Obviously, this was a supreme expression of pride, greed, and cruelty. Portugal was a Catholic country, so the Pope, Pope Eugenius IV at the time, condemned it as such on the 13th of January, 1435. Uh, quote, this is an excerpt from the, uh, section one. It has happened that in some of the said islands, referring to the Canary Islands, some Christians, we speak of this with sorrow, with fictitious reasoning and seizing an opportunity have approached said islands by ship and with armed forces taken captive and even carried off to lands overseas very many persons of both sexes, and skipping down to an excerpt from section two, and having subjected some of the inhabitants of said islands to perpetual slavery, sold them to other persons and committed other various illicit and evil deeds against them. Now, skipping down to section four of the document, we order and command all and each of the faithful within the space of 15 days of the publication of these letters in the place where they live, that they restore to their earlier liberty all and each person of either sex who were once residents of said Canary Islands. If this is not done, when the 15 days have passed, they incur the sentence of excommunication by the act itself, from which they cannot be absolved except at the point of death, even by the Holy See, unless they have first given freedom to these captive persons and restored their goods. End quote. In terms of teaching, nothing could be clearer. The Pope identified fictitious reasoning as justification, mentions the force of arms, leading to the sinful kidnapping of human beings into captivity, reducing them to the de facto status of property, ordered their immediate restoration to their rightful freedom. Now, history records he was ignored, as popes have always been ignored when they say things that people do not want to hear. Yet, no one can claim they didn't know. No one could claim that they, oh, well, they thought it was okay. Because this is about as clear as it gets. 57 years later, brings us to 1492, famous day, we all know what happened. Uh, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, stumbled on the American continents while sailing west on behalf of Spain 
in order to develop a rival trade route to East Asia, a rival, Spain and Portugal were commercial rivals. Nine years later, on December 20th, 1503, Spain implemented the right of conquest slavery already condemned by Pope Eugenius IV when it was done by Portugal. This time, the victims were the indigenous residents of the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, which today, uh, one part of the island is Haiti, the other part is the Dominican Republic. A royal decree of that date reads in part, quote, you are said governor, meaning the governor of the island of Hispaniola, will compel and force said Indians to associate with the Christians of the island and to work on their buildings and to gather and mine the gold and other metals and to till the fields and produce food for the Christian inhabitants and dwellers of the said island. This decree began the systematic enslavement of the indigenous peoples of the Americas, designated in the document as Indians, owing to the initial misunderstanding that Columbus had discovered the outer fringes of India. To put it another way, this began the plantation economy in the New World. Fifteen years later, in 1518, a license was granted by the Royal Colonial Council of Spain in the name of King Carlos I, authorizing a merchant named Lorenz de Gomino to transport 4,000 Africans as slaves to the Spanish colonies of the New World. This is the first record of a Western government involving itself in large-scale capture, which means kidnapping, transport, and sale of Africans as slaves. The first time a Western government has done this since the conversion of the Roman Empire. Now, nothing could be easier than identifying the motive. The motive was greed. And we're warned, we're warned, the Bible, we're warned against the danger of this sin of greed. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, quote, for the love of money is the root of all evils, and some people, in their desire for it, have strayed from the faith. Notice, it is not the money itself that is evil. Money is just a thing. Money cannot make decisions. To blame the money is an evasion. It is the love of money, the love of a thing that is internally disordered, leading to sinful, and the internal disorder leads to the external act, which is the sin, the sinful actions. In this case, we're studying the greed, the, 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 the connecting all the dots, commodification. So why does the government get involved in this? It issues a license to this guy to kidnap and transport 4,000 Africans as slaves. Well, this commodifies the slaves. Once they're commodified, they're counted, and they're recorded in the records, they're create, then, then they're units that can be taxed. To this end, the slave trade was licensed by governments in the same way as trade and export of gold, silver, tea, sugar, cotton, tobacco, etc. So the three-fifths clause from our Constitution that I quoted earlier which itemized persons into five categories for purposes of taxation did not just happen. It had a long and repugnant historical background. In 1526, the first African slaves land in part of, well, on land that would become part of the United States. Uh, this was a colony located on Sapelo Island, which is seven miles off the coast of present McIntosh County, Georgia. Pope Paul III repeated condemnation of slavery in another document, Sublimus Deus, dated June 2, 1537. And he expands on the reasoning uh, in the, the document we quoted from Eugenius IV. Uh, this reads in part, quote, The sublime God, 
so loved the human race that he created man in such wise that he might participate not only in the good that other creatures enjoy, but endowed him with the capacity to attain to the inaccessible and invisible supreme good. The enemy of the human race who opposes all good deeds in order to bring men to destruction, beholding and envying this, invented a means never before heard of by which he might hinder the preaching of God's word of salvation. He inspired his satellites abroad that the Indians of the West and the South and other people of whom we have recent knowledge should be treated as dumb brutes created for our service, pretending that they are incapable of receiving the Catholic faith. By virtue of our apostolic authority, we define and declare by this present letter that the said Indians and other peoples, that means the African slaves, should be converted to the faith of Jesus Christ by preaching the word of God and by the example of good and holy living. End quote. It is essential to note that official papal teaching attributed to Satan this evil. And the, it, yet he was ignored, just as Pope Eugenius IV was ignored, so the evil persisted. Time passed. On the 6th of April, 1712, in what was then the British colony of New York, later the state of New York, slaves rose up to fight for their freedom. 21 escaped slaves were captured and executed. Depend, this was the first of, depending on the criteria you use, in terms of uh, the different, uh, oh, this was the first of 31 identifiable slave revolts within the territory that later became the United States. Now that 31, they're different lists, so you, if, if you look up slave revolts, they may give different numbers. Uh, to, and you have to see the criteria. Some, it would, they'd limit it by how many were involved, how many days it lasted, was it just in one location or did it spread to other locations? Uh, was there loss, loss of life? Uh, but uh, yes, to all of those gets us a list of 31. Just in what would become the United States. That, not the whole world. There are many more in the whole world. 64 years later, in 1776, when the American Revolution commenced, 25,000 slaves escaped and fought for Great Britain in return for promised freedom. This returns the narrative to the Declaration of Independence in that year, 1776, followed in 1788 by the three-fifths calculation in the Constitution uh, that quoted earlier. So from that point, now moving forward, uh, seven American presidents were slave owners. One of them, Thomas Jefferson, acquired 850,000 square miles of land for the new republic by means of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. The political absorption of this territory took place based on the growth of a sufficient population to create territorial governments. Those territorial governments could then petition for admission to the United States as, to, uh, petition for admission to, to the Union as states. By the year 1818, Missouri had reached this status and made such a petition. Slaves had been part of the population since 1720, when it was still a French colony. At that point, it was realized that the Union of States was balanced evenly, 11 slave states, 11 free states. If Missouri were admitted as a free state, the slave states feared that the numerical imbalance in Congress would enable the abolition uh, the, uh, would, would enable the uh, outline of slavery, the abolition of slavery by, by, by law. Some southern states, fearing this, openly talked of seceding from the Union over this issue, pointing out that the Constitution recognized the legality of slavery, which it did, as you know, we already quoted, so that if the Federal Congress began to move against slavery, then they had, in effect, breached the contract that formed the Union. To preserve the Union, the Missouri Compromise was reached, which had two parts. 
the Union would remain balanced, intentionally, between slave states and free states, in furtherance of which Maine was carved out of Massachusetts as a free state, while Missouri would be admitted as a slave state. Second, the latitude, 36 degrees, 30 minutes, uh, the Mason-Dixon line, would be extended westward into the Louisiana Purchase Territory. Land admitted to the Union south of that line would automatically be slave. Land admitted north of that line would automatically be free. The relevant legislation was signed into law by the fifth president, James Monroe, on March 6, 1820. <clears throat> 19 years later, on December 3, 1839, Pope Gregory XVI again condemned slavery, specifically the slave trade. As with pre previous papal declarations, this was ignored by those who had an economic investment in perpetuating slavery. Three years later, on November 21st, 1842, the Sisters of the Holy Family came into existence under the leadership of Mother Henriette de Lille. Her life reveals another aspect of slavery, generation of a racially mixed population, meaning children born to slaves and the owners of those slaves. The population of such unions in New Orleans, for example, was large enough to prompt the Ursuline sisters to form the Ladies' Congregation of the Children of Mary. It allowed what were called then free women of color to be members, and it took as its mission the baptism and religious education of girls born of such Franco-African unions. The social service provided by this congregation was considered so important that when the Ursulines relocated their convent downriver, a school for free girls of, again, this is how they refer to the men, free girls of color, was opened in 1823 to perform the same function. It provided the girls with religious instruction, literacy, and skills such as sewing, cooking, handwriting, music, and arithmetic, which means bookkeeping. And so it happened that a wealthy New Orleans French businessman named Claude Dubriel took one of his female African slaves named Marie, I suppose the politest way to phrase it would be as his concubine. He had three children with her, all of whom were given religious instruction and literacy by the congregation. Marie's great, great granddaughter was Henriette de Lille. Henriette herself was the daughter of a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste de Lille Sarpy, and his Franco-Hispanic African concubine named Marie Diaz. Henriette also attended this school. She came to feel that while the school did have great value, more was needed. That is the background for her forming the Congregation of the Sisters of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1836. The bishop at the time, the Most Reverend Antoine Blanc, a bishop in New Orleans in 1835, and then when New Orleans became an archdiocese in 1850, he was still here, so he was the first archbishop, was impressed with her and decided to help her. Um, and uh, that is the background for uh, November 21st, 1842, the small group became the Sisters of the Holy Family. In the same year, another French missionary priest, Etienne Rousselon, established St. Augustine Parish in New Orleans to serve Catholic, again, the way they phrased it then, uh, Creoles of color, persons of color. There in that parish, he came to know Henriette, who worshiped at that parish. In the following century, which we may not be able to get to, another parishioner of St. Augustine uh, was, would enter the story again, Homer Plessy, as in the Plessy versus Ferguson case. He was from that parish. Meanwhile, in 1846, four years after the creation of the Holy Family Sisters, the United States and Mexico went to war. Uh, it's a long, that would be a whole nother presentation, but suffice it to say it was over the border with Texas. Texas had been admitted to the United States uh, a decade after seceding from Mexico, a secession which Mexico never recognized. 
At least they hadn't at that point. By 1848, the war was over. Uh, Mexico lost the territory that now comprises much of the Western United States, including what is now California. The following year, 1849, gold was discovered in California. So admission of this region was accelerated because, you know, gold does not necessarily bring out the best in people. <clears throat> this raised the slavery issue again, as it had with, with admission of the Louisiana Territory. Then we saw the issue, the slavery issue was postponed with the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So this time with California, another attempt was made to postpone the issue of slavery with the California Compromise of 1850. It consisted of five bills passed by Congress, signed by President Millard Fillmore in September of 1850. There was something in this compromise for everyone to hate, which made the Civil War only a matter of time. Paradoxically, four years later, on June 10th, 1854, the first son of a slave was ordained to the priesthood, James Augustine Healy. He was born in 1830 in the slave state of Georgia. His father, Michael, was an Irish immigrant. His mother, Eliza, was a slave. In order to become a priest, James had to leave the country for seminary, first to Montreal, then to Paris. He was ordained at uh, the, the cathedral, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, but not for that diocese. He was ordained to serve as a priest in the Diocese of Boston, Massachusetts. This was only possible because he passed, as they would, as they would have said then, uh, uh, meaning that he publicly presented himself correctly as the son of a white Irish Catholic and just left out, you know, the, the lineage of his mother. Pursuing this as a survival strategy, he was ordained later as the second bishop of Portland, Maine, on June 2nd, 1875. So depending on how one considers the matter, he could be considered the first African-American priest and bishop in the United States justified by the facts of his birth. Yet others prefer that those distinctions be accorded to the individuals who endured the hardships in their life of being publicly known as African American. So whichever one you want to consider, that's up to you. But in either case, he does have his place in history. Three years after Healy's priestly ordination brings us to the year 1857. And, and, in which another long step toward the Civil War was taken by the Supreme Court in its infamous Dred Scott versus John Sanford decision. Dred Scott was a slave in Missouri. When his owner died, he was inherited, again, you see property, that's in him. He was inherited by her brother in New York. But New York was north of the Mason Dixon line, so New York was a free state. He therefore sued claiming that he had a right to be free, you know, because of the transfer to New York. So the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. In a 7-2 to two decision, the court ruled that the Missouri Compromise, which was the basis of his appeal, was unconstitutional. Why? Because Congress did not have the authority to ban slavery at all. Based on the passages in the Constitution I read at the beginning of the, uh, of the talk. Therefore, the court ruled, a slave could not be freed by traveling to the Northern Territories. Three years later, the census year, 1860, the last census prior to the Civil War, it recorded that the United States had a total population of 31.4 million. Of those, 4.4 million were black. Of those, 3.9 million were slaves, owned by 26% of the families in the United States were slave owners. The election of Abraham Lincoln in the same year, 1860, who was a known opponent of slavery, even though he was born in a slave state of Kentucky, uh, he, had, he had moved as an adult, he made his career in Illinois, 
and he was an opponent of slavery. So that prompted action by the southern states. On Christmas Eve, 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union. The Civil War began four months later, on April 12, 1861, at the Battle of Fort Sumter, when Confederate forces opened fire on Fort Sumter at the entrance to Charleston Bay, uh, South Carolina, when the federal garrison there refused to recognize the assertion of South Carolina uh, to demand their property back since they had seceded from the Union. And so, only 85 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed, the Union of States that formed the American Republic came to an end in a bloodbath that lasted until April 9th, 1865. The different dates one could pick, but April 9th is the day that, that Robert E. Lee surrendered uh, the main Confederate army. President Lincoln himself was assassinated on April 14th, same month, just a few days later, five days after Lee's surrender. Lincoln became the first president to die by assassination and in this way became one of the 623,000 who died in the Civil War. The conclusion of the Civil War was followed in 1865 uh, by a 12-year military occupation of the former Confederate states, a period in American history known as Reconstruction. The moral and the theological error of slavery and the three-fifths person's rule that we covered at the beginning was finally erased on December 18, 1865 by the 13th Amendment. Quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Okay. But note, the dignity of the human person and the freedom of persons remain contingent on the definition of crime. Now, who defines that? And then we're back to the government. A government control by whichever political group manages to get elected to control it. So still, I mean, even though the 13th Amendment was a, you know, morally was a triumph, still, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not unalienable rights. They never were. And they still aren't. On Christmas Eve, again, 1865, 18 days after the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, six former Confederate veterans met in Pulaski, Tennessee. They formed a paramilitary resistance movement to the Northern occupation, the Ku Klux Klan. In 1871, the Mill Hill Fathers, officially the Foreign Missionary Society of London, sent priests to the United States to work with freed slaves. And oh, now I see I have two minutes left. Uh, all right. So, sorry. Uh, now, you fourth year guys, you know I spend, I spend weeks on this material. Uh, so, you know, you're not being deprived. Um, so I'll just say uh, that uh, Notre Dame Seminary, where you are now, was integrated in 1949. Uh, the first, uh, the, the seminary admit, seminarian admitted was Aubrey Osborne. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of New Orleans in 1953. Uh, and after Baton Rouge was carved into a separate diocese in 1961, Os Osborne happened to be in the boundaries there. So he remained a priest of the Diocese of Baton Rouge until his death in 1973 two months before his 51st birthday. Two months before Osborne was ordained, Archbishop Rummel promulgated a Lenten pastoral letter, Blessed Are the Peacemakers. I'll leave discussion of that for the next presentation coming up, which is given by Archbishop Hughes. He'll speak about the ecclesial perspective on these matters. Again, he also, he wrote a pastoral letter himself uh, as uh, Archbishop of New Orleans. So by way of closing, Archbishop Rummel was not popular for his stand against ethnic hatred and promoting integration. 
On the night of May 17, 1956, an eight-foot cross was mounted on the campus of Notre Dame Seminary, where you are, soaked with gasoline and set on fire. Because the Archbishop's residence was, as it still is, on the campus of the seminary. This was done uh, because of his public stand in favor of integration. Twelve years later, to, you know, to get back to where we started, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to support a strike of African-American city sanitation workers, which began in February 1968. After King was shot on April 4th, 1968, witnesses saw a man fleeing from a boarding house across the street from the Lorraine Motel, where in that boarding house, James Earl Ray had been renting a room. Police found a package dumped close to the site that included the rifle and binoculars, both with Ray's fingerprints on them. A worldwide manhunt captured Ray at London's Heathrow Airport two months later on June 8, 1968. He was on his way to Rhodesia to seek asylum. Nine months later, on March 10, 1969, he pled guilty to the first degree murder of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He was sentenced to 99 years imprisonment. At the time of his death in 1998, he had served 29 of those years. Perhaps the best close to this presentation is, is with a solution to all of these crimes and all the sins that motivate them. So with that in mind, we'll close with a summary teaching of Jesus in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke and pray that we and everyone in the world may have the wisdom, the patience, and the fortitude to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Thank you for your attention. This presentation is adjourned.